Hallelujah. The other night, I don't remember what night it was. I woke up in the middle of the night, short of breath. I was all clammy and sweating and had pains in my arms, going down my arms and in my back. Couldn't breathe. I had a pressure against my chest. And Linda said, what's wrong? I says, I said, it feels like I'm having a heart attack. I said, I can't breathe. And she said, want me to take you to the hospital? I said, no, let me go downstairs for a few minutes. I went downstairs, sat in the chair, and she prayed for me. Then she came downstairs, and she prayed for me again. And I took my Bible. I said, well, let me go upstairs. I went upstairs. I got dressed. And I went back downstairs, and I sat down. I took my Bible. My wife's my testimony, right? I stuck it on my chest. And I said, Lord, you are my healer. You are my deliverer. And I trust you, Lord. Do you want me to go to the hospital? And I didn't get an answer. And I said, okay, honey, let's go. We're going to go. And as I got up to walk, all of a sudden, the pain started to subside. And I said to her, I said, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. I said, just, just go ahead. You go to bed. I'm going to stay here. I'm just going to sit in the chair for a little while. I'm going to go upstairs, sit in the chair. And you just, if I need you, I'll call you. I said, but I feel a lot better. And then as the night went on, I got better and better and better and better. By 4 o'clock, I woke up and I went back to bed. Woke up the next day and ta-da. Oh, Praise the Lord. This word works. Hello. This word works. He says he sent his word and what? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Pray for those who are not here today. Pray for those who are lazy. Don't want to get out of bed. Pray for those who are stubborn, refuse to comply. Oh, another testimony. Thank God we've been praying for um, Sarah to pass her nurse's exam and her licensing exam, and she passed. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So when I see I'm going to hit her in the head for not being in church today. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open, please. To the book of Amos. Where is that, Pastor? I never heard of it. It's in the Old Testament. Book of Amos. I want to share with you a message that I believe God put on my heart this morning. Not a word. Not a word. You say, wow. What is that all about? Exactly that. Not a word. How many of you, if I could take a show of hands, how many of you listen to a gospel radio program? Okay. How many of you listen to a gospel program on television. Raise your hand. I have on my, my cell phone, I have a Christian radio app that gets me radios all across the United States. I can get all kind of music, all kind of messages, all kind of gospel messages. can give you all kinds of messages of the gospel. But I believe that with all of the word going out today, there is still a famine of hearing God's word. Amen? And while I'm thinking of it, please pray for Priscilla. She's sharing at an Assembly of God church in Saugus, Mass. today. She's sharing what happened in uh, her trip to uh, Jordan and so forth. And when she comes back, she's going to share. We're going to put a time together for her to come and share some of the slides with us too. But I believe as much as we have the word on television and on, we have the, the word on radio, I believe that there is a famine of hearing the word. Now, that doesn't seem to sound right. It sounds contradictory almost, but it's not. We are the most generation to have proliferated the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. The word of God goes out radio 24-7.
television 24-7. You see ministries proclaiming that their ministries are reaching all the nations of the earth. We have the word of going out. But then my question is this, then why are we still living without a revival? Why are we still living in a time of gloom and darkness? Why is sin so rampant in our nation, in our, in our city? Why is it so rampant in churches? Because I believe that there is a famine of hearing the word. It doesn't mean that the word is not being preached. I have a book uh, called The Ministry of God's Word by Watchman Nee. If any of you would like to get a copy of that, I suggest you do. Especially if you want to preach or you want to share the gospel. And he says, not everyone that stands behind a pulpit proclaiming the word of God is teaching and preaching the word of God. Many times Jesus spoke and that was the word of God. But then he added this, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit has to say. It's not so much a hearing with your natural ears, but it's a hearing with your spiritual ears of discernment. To hear the word of the Lord for what the word of the Lord is for today. And in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, the prophet is speaking. And he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. I want you to understand, the Bible says, too much is given, much is required. I want you to understand that the more you hear the gospel, the more you hear the teaching of God's word, the more you are responsible for it. And when God sees that people will not respond to his word, then God is going to send a famine, not of bread, not a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now I want you to for a moment understand that when Amos was talking about this, that shortly after this came a time as we know it as the silent years or the intertestamental period. You say, well what is that? That's the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was known as the 400 silent years. But before I tell you about that, and before we go into that, I want to share with you another prophet, what he said. In the book of Malachi, which is not too far from there, the last book of the Bible, just before Matthew, Another prophet rose up. Malachi. Chapter 4, verse 5. Well, let's go to verse 4, if I can. He says to them, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Now he's talking to the Jews who know the law. See, they knew the law, but they were not living according to its ordinances. They had the word of God in their mind, they knew the Ten Commandments. They knew what God had said. But they were not living their life according to the ordinances of God. They were not, they were not living what they heard. And so the prophet comes along and it's, he's the last of the prophets to speak. Listen to me. For over 400 years. God said, okay, you don't want to hear what I have to say? I'm going to shut down my prophetic word. I'm not going to speak to you for 400 years. 
Now understand, they didn't have Bibles in their hands like you have and I have today. So when God said he wasn't going to give a word, guess what? They didn't have anything. All they had the remembrance of the word, of the, of the law. And only the priests had that in the scrolls. But the priests were corrupt. Those who served the house of the Lord were corrupt. The, the judges and the governors and the princesses were all corrupt. They went through so many different takeovers. The governments took over. You know, the Babylonians, the uh, Assyrians, the Grecians, Alexander the Great, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes came on the scene, destroyed the temple. So many hurtful things were going on. But God gave this prophet one last message. And he told them, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him, in Horeb of all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Then verse 5. Look what he says. Behold, take notice, pay attention, what I'm about to say. That's what the prophet's saying. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That was the last words that God spoke in over 400 years. I want you to think for a moment. And I believe this. That God has sent a famine in America who has so much heard the word of God. So much heard over radio and over television. And we have Bibles and we have books and we have so much information. We have the internet that we can go and get information after information about the things of God and learning of God. But my question to you is this. How much of what we are learning and knowing are we doing? Are we hearing what God is saying to us in the last days? Are we hearing his voice? Are we tuned into listening to him and what he is saying to the church which is you and me? Are we listening? He says, I'm going to send Elijah. That's going to be a sign that I will speak to you again. Because if you know that who he's talking about here, he's not talking about literal Elijah, but he's talking about John the Baptist, who's going to come in the spirit of Elijah. But John the Baptist was a what? What was he? Christianity 101. What was John the Baptist? He was a prophet. Wasn't he? Okay. I'm glad we got that settled. <laughs> Turn with me to Luke. Now remember, 400 years of silence. No word of God. No church. Hello? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine going through not having any fellowship? Can you imagine, I mean, I don't know about you. If I'm around a person who's depressed, I try to help that person out of their depression. Okay? I don't want to be dragged down to that depression. Okay? I want to pull them up out of their depression. But just think for a moment. That you come out of your house one day, and every person that you see is depressed. Every person you talk to is depressed. Every time, wherever you go to work, everyone at work is depressed. Your bosses are depressed. The people and your friends and your relatives are depressed. After a while, you get depressed. Being around so many people that are depressed. Not only were the people at this time, understand, generation after generation after generation after generation were going without hearing a word from God. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but what? 
By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You cannot survive spiritually unless you have something to be fed spiritually. And that is the word of God. And not only being hearers of the word, but being doers of the word. That's where the blessing comes. And so now we had Malachi. We had Amos prophesy that there's a famine coming. Before the day, dreadful day of the Lord, there's a famine coming. And then he says, but I'm going to give you hope. See, that's the thing about God. He always gives you hope. He's telling you, this is what's going to happen, but I want you to know there's hope coming. I'm going to send, uh, I'm going to send you a prophet, and he's going to be uh, in the spirit of Elijah, and he's going to come and proclaim the, the, the day of the Lord. Now I want to take you through that. Understand, Jerusalem was captured. They were under Roman rule. Their rights were taken away. They were in bondage, and they were in slavery. They were depressed. They were oppressed. And think about it. From day one to, say, 200 years, generation after generation, waiting for that word to come forward. How people's hearts were, were burning within them. God, when is it going to happen? When are you going to sing that? When are you going to sing that? Uh, send that Elijah to us. When are you going to send that prophet to us that will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the children's hearts back to the father? Lord, when are you going to do that? And they waited and they waited and they waited and year after year and 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 uh, generation after generation, century after century, after three hundred years, the promise still didn't come to pass. You can understand that the hearts of many were failing. Many were giving up. They were so tired of the polytheism of worshipping of many gods that the Romans and the Greeks had instituted in their lives. They were not satisfied with what they had. They wanted something more. They wanted the prophetic word of God back into their life. But they couldn't hear it no matter how much they pleaded, no matter how much they asked God for it. It wasn't coming. Why? Because God had proclaimed that there would be a time of famine. And I don't know about you, but there are times when I really desire and really hunger for more of God. Does that ever happen to you? you, just, you there's a time that you just want more of God. I believe that those are times that God puts in our life so that we can have more of Him. We can desire more of Him. We can want to be in church. We can want to be in Bible study. We can want to be at prayer. We want to be at every service. I remember years ago when I was just a Christian, I wasn't serving the Lord in ministry. And I remember being at Pastor Norman's. And I remember, he had four or five services a week. Remember, remember Sister Debbie? We used to go to church five, six times a week. And if there ever there was a service, we ran to church. We wanted to be there. Because God was doing something. Amen. And it's sad today. You have to pull teeth. You've got to, get, you've got to try to get people on time. You've got to do all kinds of things to get people to come to the house of God. That's because you're dry and you're dead and you're going through a famine. And let me tell you, if you don't eat something soon, you'll die of starvation. God is saying, I'm going to bring a prophetic word. Get ready, church, get ready. God is going to speak a prophetic word to this ministry. God's going to get us a certain prophetic word for this ministry that's going to, come, it's going to propel it out. You're going to see it. Let's go to Luke. Chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says there was in the day of Herod, the king of Judea. Herod was appointed by the Roman government, by the Roman Empire. In the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Ever feel like you just go through the motions? As a Christian, sometimes you feel you're just going through the motions. That's what the people of Israel were going through. They were just going through the motions. 
offering the sacrifices, just going through the motions. And a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, please understand, when it says this, it doesn't mean that they were perfect. It means that when they did sin on the Day of Atonement, once a year, they would bring their sacrifices. Their heart was right. They wanted to get right with God. It wasn't that they didn't sin at all. It doesn't mean that they, they followed all the commandments all the time, all, the, you know, all year long. No. But God counted it to them for righteousness because of faith of Abraham. Because they believed in the shed blood. They believed that they had a covering for this sin. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass, see those words came to pass? <laughs> this is awesome. Because now you're going to see the end of the 400 years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God, in the, mit, in, the, in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense. And when he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of people were praying without at time of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord. This is the first time God is going to start to speak once again. This is amazing. 400 years of silence. And God brings not a prophet, but the very angel Gabriel that stands in the presence of the Lord. Somebody say amen. 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 To speak to Zacharias, the high priest. Or the priest, rather, sorry. And the angel of the Lord appeared standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Fear not, Zachari Zach Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Here's the first prophetic word coming to pass of Malachi. He's going to send his prophet that's going to change the hearts of the fathers back to the children, children back to the father. It's John the Baptist. But I want you to know something that God goes through the process of time. First thing that he makes impossible is for John, uh, it's for Zacharias and his wife to have a baby because they passed their years. God likes us to have faith. Amen. And he'll use the most unexpected people to fulfill his word. And he comes, he says, your wife and you, I heard your prayers, God's heard your prayers, You're gonna have, your wife's going to have a baby. And you're going to name him John. Verse 14. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is all prophetic, because it hasn't happened yet. Even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God. Now look at verse 17. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias. This angel is testifying that what the prophet had spoken 400 something years earlier was true. Because angels don't lie. And the angel was telling him who this baby was going to be. And he says, 
He will go before him in the spirit of Elias and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Here comes the prophecy fulfilled. Verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. He says, how can I know this? Because, listen, I don't know if you know this about not, Angel. I don't know if you're taking a good look, but me and my wife have passed the time of having children. <laughs> Hear me now. Zacharias didn't have ears to hear what the Spirit of God was saying. He heard him with his natural ear, but he didn't discern with his spiritual ear Hello? He wasn't listening. He said, what is this? I don't know. How am I going to know this? I'm an old man and my wife is, you know, stricken in years. How, how's that going to happen? Look at verse 18. Or verse 19. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God. Man, how I would love to have a visit from Gabriel that stood in the presence of God. Man. He says, I am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee glad tidings. You and I have to have ears to hear again what the Spirit of God has to say. God's not going to hold us guiltless. Look what he did to this man. Next verse. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak. And I said, Lord, why did you do that? Why did you cause him not to speak? What happened when they wouldn't listen to the prophetic word? What happened to the Israelites? They didn't hear not a word. Why? Because God was not speaking. Zacharias couldn't speak. Because he could not hear the prophetic word. And I believe that Zacharias, when he couldn't speak, brought him back to the time of 400 years where God didn't speak to him. In fact, the Bible says nowhere after that that God did speak to him after that. He left him dumb, not talking. So the priest could not give one word. Couldn't speak. He said, until the day that these things shall be performed. In other words, you're not going to speak until the prophetic word that I'm giving you is fulfilled. Wow. So 400 silent years... Not one word from God. You can imagine the people's hearts. And now here's the priest. Smitten cannot speak. Because he didn't believe the word of the Lord. Because thou believest not my words. Look. Verse 20. Until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their, what? Season. Say it with me. In their, Season. in their, Season. come on, say it out. Season. God's prophetic word always has a season. We want to rush that word. We want that word to hurry up. 
But God is going to perform those things which he has spoken unto you in its season. What do you have to do? Believe. Just believe it. And the people waited for him, Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. Gee, I wonder what's going on. Been in there for a long time. <laughs> and when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it says, and as soon as it came to pass, as soon as the days of administration were accomplished, he departed from, to his own house. Excuse me. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself for five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked upon me to take away my reproach from among men. Now that he saw his wife pregnant, how come he didn't start speaking? Because the angel already told them. Until it be fulfilled in their season. Now she was five months pregnant. She still had four months to go. Right? At the same time, six months later. Another angel was on assignment. And I want you to understand that John the Baptist was the last prophet to say, Thus saith the Lord. All other prophets in the New Testament said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. God sent the angels, hear me now, God sent the angels so that men would not rely upon the prophets until the prophet would come. And so he sent an angel. He sends an angel to this little girl named Mary. And he gives a salutation to Mary. He says, Mary, you're favored about, among women. You, God's grace is upon you. You're going to have a child. You're going to name him. You're going to be a child of the Most High God. You're going to name him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. What was Mary's response? She says, how can this be, Lord, when I don't know a man? And then he explains to her, and she says, she didn't say, well, that's impossible, God. Understand what they went through. Here, you're a woman, right? You're, you're praying, and you're, you're, you're in your house, and all of a sudden an angel shows up and says, um, you know, you're highly favored among women, and God wants to... Uh, Give you a seed so that you'll be pregnant so that you can bring forth the Messiah. Yeah, but I don't know a man. I never knew a man. That's what her response was. And then as you start to see the months go by, you see your stomach growing. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So she's into saying to the Lord, Lord, let it be according to thy will. She had ears to hear. Are you hearing me? She had ears to hear. She said, Lord, let it be according to what you want. I'm going to do and allow what you want to allow. Think about it, because she would have been ridiculed. She would have been ostracized. Because here she's pregnant, and they're going to think she was with a man, and maybe Joseph, and they had premarital sex, and that was going to be a whole disgrace upon the family and the family names. Let me jump ahead a little bit. A few months before Elizabeth is ready to have birth. Maybe a month or two. Mary decides to go and see Elizabeth. She goes and sees Elizabeth and as she gives her salutation as she walks through the door. 
the baby in Elizabeth's womb be, leaps. And the Bible says John was filled and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And so Elizabeth starts talking to Mary and saying, When I heard your salutation, the baby leaped in my womb. Let's look at that for a moment. In fact, in verse 36 of Luke 1, it says, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, shall, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month. So she was six months pregnant when Mary got pregnant. And this is the sixth month of, with her, and who was called barren. For with God... Nothing shall be impossible. If I said that to you today, that you know that you could personally have a child without a physical relationship with somebody, if I said that to you 20, 30, 40 years ago, you'd say that's impossible. Now you can. A woman can have, you know, without having, you know, and have, you know. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now look at verse 39. And Mary arose in the, those days and went to the hill country with haste into this, Judah. And then Elizabeth greeted her, told her that what happened. Then Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She needed a Savior. She wasn't sinless. Sorry, Roman Catholicism. She didn't. She wasn't sinless. She had a Savior, too. Let's look at verse 37. Now Elizabeth's full time came. That she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. Neighbors came over, cousins heard about it, and how the Lord had showed great mercy on her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, that they came, called him Zacharias. Isn't it wonderful how your family gives a name to your baby? <laughs> Figuring, well, he's going to be named after the father. I'm going to call him Zacharias. What did the angel say? Angel said, John, the prophetic name that God wanted for that boy was John, not Zacharias. But see, sometimes in the family we think, well, the son's going to follow in the father's footsteps. See, the father was a priest, so therefore the son, we're going to name him after the father, and he's going to be a priest too. If I can bring it into today's vernacular, we have pastors that have sons... And they give the son the father's name and think that just because he's the son, he's going to be a pastor too. That doesn't always work out. Maybe God wants him to be a lawyer. Maybe God wants him to be an engineer. Maybe God wants him to be a plumber. Maybe God wants him to be a lawyer or a doctor or someone else that he wants to use. Why do we always tend to think that God has to do things in the same pattern all the time? That's why so many, so many pastors' kids backslide because they feel the pressure that the Father puts on them to follow Him in, in their footsteps and be what, they, what He wants them to be and not what God wants them to be. So don't do that to your children. Those of you who don't have children yet, don't do that to your children. Don't force them into the footsteps of who you think they should be. Let them be what God calls them to be. And it came to pass on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, called, called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, not so. This was very unusual. A woman would not usurp authority over a man's decisions. But she stood up. She said, no. Uh-uh. See, what, I'm, what, this, what we get out of this is, yes, you obey your husbands, ladies, in the Lord. If they're asking you to do something contrary to God and what God said, you don't have to listen. Amen. You be respectful, and you be kind, and you be loving, and you tell them, I cannot do that. It's against what God's word 
says. I'm not doing it. And husbands, you have to respect that. And if you don't, you're, God's going to deal with you. He will. Amen. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table. And he wrote saying, his name is John. And they all marveled. But I want you to understand, that this is so significant. When he wrote on that tablet, his name is going to be John, that was the moment that he believed the prophetic word. What happened in the next verse? Somebody tell me. And his mouth was opened immediately. <laughs> as soon as he came into agreement with the prophetic word. He was able to begin to speak again. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue was loosed. And he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt around them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. What was noised abroad? What was so big deal? He began to speak. What was the big deal? The prophecy was fulfilled. He believed it. He wrote it. And the moment he did, his mouth was open immediately because he believed that prophetic word. This is awesome. Look what he says. And all that heard them lay up, laid up in their hearts saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 Let me tell you, when you begin to believe the prophetic word, when you begin to believe that Jesus wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit, when you believe that prophetic word that says you shall be baptized after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me both in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the othermost parts of the earth, that God wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. If you believe that prophetic word, even though it hasn't happened like this man, it didn't happen right away, but don't doubt and don't dis despair just believe God and that is coming your way immediately the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Ghost and what happened he prophesied <laughs> you cannot begin to prophesy if you don't have ears to hear the prophetic word now understand, I'm talking about the prophetic word, not the pathetic. Because there's a lot of people out there giving the pathetic word. They're giving it all for money and for all this other stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about a false word. I'm talking about hearing a word from God. Getting a word from God, from the Spirit of God. Being filled with the Holy Spirit and beginning to prophesy. This is what he prophesied. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he hath visited and redeemed his people. Wait a minute. That hasn't happened yet. What is faith? It hasn't happened yet. What is faith? Believing that it has already been done. Isn't that what faith is? Faith is the, hub, hope, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you believe God has already done that thing, you come into alignment with the prophetic word of God, it sets in motion those things to happen. When you doubt and you start to be like Zacharias, guess what? It puts a prolong on the word coming forward. God will, God will fulfill it. He said, blessed the Lord God as far as... The Lord has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. 
Listen to this. As he spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets. Now he's coming back. Now the word's coming back from the prophets of old. Listen to this. This is great. Which have been since the world began. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that, of them that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember the holy covenant. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Now he's starting to get all of the prophetic river flowing in his life. Hey man, we're going, to get the, we're going to get the blessings of Abraham back. We're going to get the covenant back. He's all excited now. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. He can speak again. All the things that he wanted to say and do can now come to, come to, uh, come to pass in, in what he's saying. Look, verse 74. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. Look at this. It's all coming back now. Because they weren't living in holiness. They weren't living in righteousness. Before him all the days of our life. Oh, this is great. And then he says this. looks down at his son he takes his son verse 76 he's holding his son he says and thou child look he's speaking to his son he's speaking to his child I wish I had a baby or maybe somebody small enough I could hold <laughs> and thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest now he begins to prophesy. See, he couldn't do that because before he couldn't speak. And because he couldn't speak, he was because he couldn't believe the word of the Lord. But now he believes the word of the Lord. Now he gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Now he begins to prophesy. And now he begins to speak to his very child. And he says, child, you're going to be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord and to prepare his ways. How does he know that? How he knows that is because he's filled with the spirit and the mind of the spirit and not his own mind. I mean, that's great for parents who want great things for their kids, right? But this didn't come because he was his parent. This came because he was speaking, prophesying what the Lord was using him, giving him the words to speak over his children. He says, For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Verse 77. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Hallelujah. Next verse. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high visited us. Next verse. Oh, look at this. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is all prophecy. This is all prophetic. Next verse. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. What is God saying to you? When you open up the Bible, do you just open up the Bible to read it as a, just a book to, you know, something so you can read it and just get some information and facts about God? No. It's good for that, but it's much more than that. When you open up the Bible, it's to renew your mind because your mind needs to be renewed. Because we have some ways of thinking about the things of God and God himself that need to be transformed because maybe it's not quite the way the scriptures portray him I know so many people that we talk to over time you know you go out and you talk to people and you say you know that God's gonna bring judgment oh my God would never do that my God is a God of love 
Well, does your God have a little bow and arrow and a little heart and he shoots it at people? Is that the God you're talking about? The God of love? Yes, God is love. But God is just and God is righteous and God is holy. The same God of love is going to open up the scrolls of, of the wrath of God and revelation poured out upon the earth. Same Jesus. So we open up the word of God and what do we get out of it? What do you get out of it? When I open up the word of God and I get these messages from God for you, it's for me too. And I sit there and I go, wow, check this out. Wow, look at that. I get excited. I'm like, wow, God, that's why you shut his mouth. But it takes time to meditate on the word. It takes time to look at this and say, wow, God. You... And then God, when, when he wrote the name John, his mouth was open immediately. And what did he do? He was filled with the Holy Ghost. And what happened after that? He began to praise God and worship God. What happened after that? He had a prophetic word from God. What are you getting out of God? Or should I say it this way? What is God getting out of you? What does God want to get out of you? Maybe he wants something out of you. In order to fill you with something. So that you can speak something. Maybe God wants to give you a fresh prophetic word in your life. Maybe God wants to encourage you. But God can't encourage you if you're so bound up with things of the world. Wasting time with things of the world. But God wants to speak to you. God wants to use you. So after 400 years of silence, you know the best news of all? Do you know the one thing that God began to speak which was better than any prophetic word that was ever spoken over anyone over after those 400 years? He spoke the good news. He took the word that was with him and that was him and became flesh and dwelt among us. The prophetic word the holy word, the eternal word, walked among us. And now, hallelujah, here's Jesus, born of a virgin, comes into the world at his birth, who is the prophet, because Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, God who in sundry times and diverse ways and diverse manners has spoken to us through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken unto us through his Son, and now Jesus comes on the scene, hallelujah. He's born and he, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and put into a manger. And all of a sudden men are coming to him and they're bowing down before him and giving him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And they're saying, this is the promised Messiah. This is the one that's going to come and deliver Israel. And all of a sudden King Herod hears about that. And he's appointed by Rome, and his allegiance is to Rome. And he, he comes and says, wait a minute, we can't have somebody overthrowing the government. So he says, you know what we're going to do? How long ago was it that you saw this baby? He said, I don't know, maybe a year or two or whatever it was. And he said, well, here's a decree. And I want you to understand, this is what the devil does. He says, I want you to go out and kill every baby two years old and under. Why? Why did Herod want that? Why did the devil through Herod want that? Because the devil was trying to stop the prophetic word from speaking. He didn't want you to have... Listen now, come on, don't pay attention. Don't, don't be distracted. God wanted you to know. Devil didn't want you to know. That's why the devil tried to kill Jesus at two years old and under. Because he didn't want the prophetic word to come forward. He didn't want you to have this book in your hand. Hello? That's 
That's what you have is God's prophetic book right here. The word of God. He didn't want you to have that. So he wanted to kill Jesus so that Jesus couldn't perform the will of God to save your soul. But God warned Joseph in a dream. He says, take the mother and the child. Go to Nazareth. Go to Nazareth. Why? Because in being obedient, listen now. In being obedient and going to Nazareth, not only was he fulfilling scripture without knowing, for he shall be called the Nazarene, the prophet said. He didn't know that. He didn't say, wow, that's right. The Bible says he's going to be a Nazarene, so let's go to Nazareth. No. But the scriptures knew that. The prophetic was in motion. And now here, Joseph has a dream. So I'm going to follow the Lord. He wants us to go to Nazareth. We're going to Nazareth. He goes to Nazareth to preserve the prophetic word. And not only, does he, not only does he perform the prophetic word, the Christ, but he also saves the prophetic word that says out of Nazareth he shall come. He shall be called the Nazarene. Yes, not the denomination. <laughs> He'll be called the Nazarene. God's prophetic word. Listen to me. God preserved his prophetic word for you. That's how important this Bible is. Because you can read this Bible and God can speak a prophetic word to you from this Bible. You could be going through the lowest, most darkest time in your life. You could be going through a most depressed time in your life. And you can read these words that Jesus spoke to his disciples and say, Lo, I am with you always. And that word can be prophetic and come alive to you and bring you hope and bring you encouragement and bring you uh, a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Proverbs says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. Whew. Come on. Words are powerful. But there's nothing more powerful than a prophetic word that you can stand on in these last days. I'm telling you, I know things are getting worse and worse and the world's getting worse and worse and the economy's getting worse and worse. And I know that lawlessness is, prev is prevailing. I know that the Antichrist spirit is alive and well and moving and, and, and like a tidal wave through our nation. But I want you to know one thing. His word will never... Never fail. His word shall come to pass. I don't have to concentrate and keep my eyes on the Antichrist. I'm looking for the Christ. My Bible tells me when you see all these things happening, look up. He didn't say look down. He didn't say look to the left, look to the right. Look up for your redemption draws nigh. That's a prophetic word. Jesus is coming back real soon. Hallelujah. He's coming back soon. The word says so. I don't care what Obama says, and I don't care what the Muslims say, and I don't care about what's going on in Israel. Let me tell you something. Israel will be preserved. It may look like they're getting defeated, but I'm going to tell you something. They're going to be preserved. And it's almost going to be like they're going to be defeated. All the nations are going to surround Israel. They're going to attack all that one time. But then the Bible says the trump shall sound. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the angel shall come forward. And Jesus, who's coming on a white horse. The white horse is a symbol of conquering. And he's going to come and he's going to deliver Israel. He's going to fight for Israel. And there's no atomic bomb, no hand-to-air missile, nothing of those things that are going to stop him. No atomic, no nuclear weapon is going to stop him. Are you hearing me? Because when he comes, he's coming with his saints. And you and I are going to be with him. Hallelujah. Amen? Praise God. Believe 
the book of Revelation. Believe the prophetic word. There's still the book of Revelation that needs to come to pass. It's still prophetic. It's an unveiling. It's a revelation. It's of apocalypse, but it's a revealing. and un, un, it's, it, it's an unfolding of things that are going to take place. Believe it. Say, but I don't understand all the dragon heads and lions and all those kind of things. Don't worry about those things. Read Daniel, Ezekiel, and Revelation together. You'll get the full revelation. Amen. Amen. And what did Jesus say in Revelation in closing? Let's look at the last verse in Revelation. And please call it Revelation, not Revelations. It's not plural, it's singular. It's one Revelation. With many, many things revealed, but it's one revelation. Chapter 22, verse 6. Revelation 22, verse 6. And he said unto me, John, right? On the Isle of Patmos, persecuted for the testimony of Jesus. He said unto me, these sayings are what? These sayings are what? These sayings are? The book of Revelation is faithful and true. In other words, faithful because they're going to happen. One third of the earth's population is going to die. One third of the sea's population is going to die. One third of the population of the earth is about 2.2 billion people. Think about it. 2.2 billion people are going to die. It's in the Bible. It's in Revelation. And he said, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant the things which must, what? Shortly be done. Another angel, just like the other angels, but another angel, not going to lie. These things are coming to pass. Look what he says in verse 7. Now Jesus is speaking, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keep the sayings of the what? Of the what? Of this book. You'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To every man according to his works shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Uh-oh. To the churches. To the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, which means that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the bright morning star. Look at this. And verse 20, And he which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. The prophecy of this book is faithful and it's true. It's going to happen, folks. So ask the Lord. Say, Lord, I haven't heard from you lately. Am I in a famine? Am I in a famine? Am I not listening? Or if I'm listening, am I not obeying? Or if I'm, if I'm listening, am I not believing? God, I want to believe your prophetic word that you're speaking to the church in these last days. So that I can be filled with your Holy Spirit. And I can prophesy and begin to speak the word of God to others. I'm telling you. Jesus said in the last days in Matthew... He says, you're going to stand before judges and you're going to stand before 
people of high places. And they're going to be astounded at the wisdom that you have. Be ready to speak the prophetic word. The Bible says that you may all prophesy in Corinthians. God wants you all to prophesy. But you've got to have an ear to hear the message to prophesy. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's, let's, let's pray. Father, let your people hear. Let your people hear the prophetic word spoken this morning. Let them be encouraged to know that you're faithful and you're true. And everything you said and everything that you've said to us, Lord, and everything that you promised us is going to come. It's going to happen. It's going to be fulfilled because, Lord, you're not a man that you should lie. And everything you've said, everything you've spoken shall come to pass. And it's time. Lord, help us to believe the truths of your word. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. Give us understanding, Father. Give us a heart to, to believe those words of prophecy that you've given us in your word and to stand upon them no matter what it looks like from the outward, no matter what the circumstances may be, no matter if it looks like we've come to the final stage of the end of it. Because, Lord, you always, always bring your promises through the death process. It makes it look like it's dead, never to be resurrected again. Joseph thought his promise was dead when he was in prison. 